thank you for coming. As I'm new to the uh, Qt community, I thought that I'd introduce myself first. Um, I've been programming graphics since 1984, uh, 83, depends a bit on how you count it. Um, I've been always interested in how stuff is done, how it works, how can you do these effects that you see in games, all that things. Um, I learned OpenGL 1.x in the uh, 1990s when I was in the old university studying there. Um, I joined Nokia's Graphics Knowledge Center back in 2005 and uh, became the lead for the Nokia side uh, effort to make the Symbian graphics architecture more hardware accelerator friendly because the GPUs, graphics processing units, they were coming to the mobile and the architecture of Symbian wasn't really geared towards that in the beginning. Uh, then I started participating to chrono standardization. I was part of the open code working group. Uh, you can find my name in EGL 1.4 specification. Um, I was the chair of the OpenWF 1.0 uh, group working group for two years. Um, I joined DGIA last year. I became part of the team that did the Qt data visualization that you may have seen running in our booth. And then I started, late last year, I started to experiment and implement the uh, Qt Canvas 3D, which I'm talking about today. In general, in the office, everybody knows me as the graphics dude. So if, if somebody has a graphics question, they usually turn to me and I try to scratch my head and wonder like, wow, why? what is that? How does, how does this work in Qt? But here's an overview. Uh, I'm going to be first talking a bit about what is WebGL, uh, the, about the history, uh, what can be done with it, shows a few demos. Um, then I'm going to be introducing you to the uh, Qt Canvas 3D, uh, which is an implementation of the WebGL API on QML, and then show you how the, you can use it in your own code, uh, show a few examples, uh, show the 3JS library port that I have done on top of Qt Canvas 3D, and then talk a little bit about the future developments, plans that we have for the Qt uh, Canvas 3D. So, WebGL. How many of you know already what is WebGL? Can I show, show of hands? Okay, pretty good. How many of you have actually done something with WebGL? Okay, still a couple of people. Excellent. So I can expect difficult questions. So, uh, just to get everybody on the same page, here is the uh, short history of WebGL. It was standardized by Kronos Group, and it's a non-profit technology consortium that handles WebGL, OpenGL, OpenGL ES, and a bunch of other open APIs. Um, it was um, based on the OpenGL ES 2.0 standard. And uh, many people have asked me, why, why OpenGL ES 2, why not OpenGL? Well, basically, the uh, mobile was booming at the time when the standardization became, became started. So, uh, Basically, they wanted to make it as portable on the mobile devices as possible. So using OpenGLE as, to, as the base was the way to go. But in fact, in the beginning, there was a lot of uh, discussion between like, should, we, should the API be this low-level state-based API where you have to go in and you have to load your shaders, you have to compile them, link them, you have to load your textures, you have to say, well, in this texture unit, make this texture active, uh, make this uh, uh, shader code now active, and then draw a bunch of triangles, and then you have to rinse and repeat that multiple times per frame. And there was also proponents of using a scene graph-based approach where you would just have, like, uh, load an object, place it here, put the camera here, put the light here, and be done with it. Um, there was a lot of back and forth between this, and... Uh, the group that I was with, uh, we proposed that we go with the uh, low-level API because the, usually a, a um, scene graph-based API, it starts to limit the innovation. Uh, it has a fixed set of functions and, and enablers and effects that you can use, so it doesn't really grow as the community grows and the needs grow. So you have to can keep updating the API for the scene graph. Whereas if you enable the uh, low-level API, what it allows you to have is free playing field. You can innovate on top of that, you can build on top of that, and it's, it's a much more stable API. And luckily, the low-level API won, even though some people still think that it, it would have been nice to have the screen graph, but as I'll show you later on, it's not a problem, actually. Um, 
Initially, the web shell standard was released in 2011, and already back then you had some nightly builds of uh, Chrome, for, Chrome, for example, to uh, support it. But the actual stable release of 1.0.2 was released just last year. And now, if you look at the mobile uh, browser landscape, you can see that it's basically supported by everyone. Even Internet Explorer now supports it. Uh, not quite fully standardized yet, but it's, it's getting there. So what happens when you have an API like this that is available on multiple browsers, basically everywhere? So what you get innovation. And there are many, many libraries that are built on top of WebGL. Uh, for example, scene graph uh, libraries. Um, I'm mentioning four here because those are the ones that keep popping up when you Google for uh, scene graph on WebGL. I myself, I have used the top two, 3JS and scene.js. Uh, O3D is a uh, something uh, done by Google. Seems to be pretty, pretty popular. I haven't myself used it. Uh, open Zine Graph, for some people that means something. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it seems like many people are saying, hurrah, now Open Zine Graph is available on the web. Uh, also, there are other libraries and resources that have been built on top of WebGL. Uh, you can go to Kronos web page and see a listing of user contributions. And you can also go and see a lot of uh, other resources that relate to WebGL, like there is a bunch of tutorials available on the Mozilla website and, and a bunch of other sites that you can use to get started with WebGL. So what can be then done with WebGL? So here is a couple of examples. Some of you may have heard of the Zygote body, which is a uh, human body atlas. And it's a 3D model, fully interactive, where you can just scale how deep into the human body you want to go into. Do you want to look at the skeleton? Do you want to look at the uh, blood circulation system? And it's fully interactive 3D. I'm going to show that soon. Uh, many of you use Google Maps. That's now more like the Google Earth used to be just a couple of years ago with all the 3D models in, in view in the web page. And also big companies like Autodesk are moving to using WebGL. So for example, Autodesk now has AutoCAD 360 available and it's a web implementation of AutoCAD and runs on top of WebGL. And then if you want to go and just look something really beautiful things that are done with WebGL, you should go to Chrome Experiments slash WebGL. There, there's a bunch of really, really nice looking uh, demos, and a, demos in there. Let's look at a couple of those live here just to get an idea. So let's first look at the uh, Zygote body. So here you can see a fully interactive, oops, sorry, human model. And then you can start just lining away, peeling away the skin. Then you can see the bones, you can see the internal organs, blood circulation system, all the down to the nervous system, looking at how the brains are constructed. And this is not really exactly uh, photorealistic, luckily. It would be a bit yucky if it was. If, if it, was. It, was more, it is more of an illustrative uh, style of graphics. Uh, but when you go into Google Maps, this is much more realistic. You can see that there are 3D buildings. And especially if you go into this tilt view, you can really see that these are really 3D objects in here with really nice texturing. Uh, then just last weekend, I realized that there is now a project ongoing called uh, blend for web that allows you to make content with Blender and the game engine that is inbuilt into Blender, and then you, you can export that on top of WebGL. So here's one example that has been done like that. It takes a while to load. It seems to be pretty heavy, but once you see the content, you can understand that there is quite a bit of stuff that it needs to load over the web. So here is a scene. You can see that there is a pretty nice reflective water going on. The trees are whispering in the wind. Grass is moving. And if you we go and run over the bridge, you can see animals there, animated, grazing the fields. You have a horse walking about, and even a cat walking in the grass. And to me, what this means is this is pretty impressive in the sense that 
having this will solve the age-old problem that you have, that once you have some uh, 3D technology, then how do you get the content in there? Um, how, how does the pipeline work? How do you get something, some useful stuff running in there? And this is really promising. And once I get, once I get back to home, I think I'm going to be looking at this, that uh, would it be possible to maybe make this work on top of the Qt Canvas 3D? And then you may have seen this demo running in our booth if you have visited there. This is a car visualizer. As you can see, it says here it's done with WebGL and a 3JS scene graph library. And it's just a uh, fully interactive view of cars. Uh, you can change the car models. Uh, you can change the uh, color of the car. But one thing I would like to highlight here is that, for example, in here, when you change the color, you can see that the color changes like snap quickly. There's no animations there. Also, uh, when you change the rims, that's the same case here. It just changes like that. Um, and also, when, once we, um, you'll let us see a port of this on top of uh, Qt Canvas 3D. And when we started porting this, we realized that, well, there is actually quite a few issues with this. Uh, for example, you can't really use it on touch devices. Uh, it doesn't handle input too well from that. Well, we fixed that, and we added a bunch of stuff on top of that. But if you want to go and see nice stuff done with uh, WebGL, go to this page. There is piles and piles and piles of different examples of what can be done with WebGL. Oops. Okay, going back to the presentation. So let's move on. That was about the WebGL, uh, what it is, what can be done with it. Let's move over to the uh, Qt Canvas 3D. I'll first describe what it is. It's a Qt module. It implements a 3D Canvas component that you can inject into your Qt Quick Scene, just like any other Qt Quick component. Uh, and that allows you to get a WebGL-like context API from the Canvas component. And I stress the word like because even though Qt Canvas 3D, we, it implements now all the functions from WebGL 1.0.2 API, it is not tested to be conformant. And the reason for that is that the current WebGL conformance tests, they are basically a bunch of HTML pages, and it's a bit difficult to run those in just QML. Uh, or, or the Qt Quick uh, scene graph. So let's see, uh, we are looking at that. Um, and we would also like to hear from you, how important do you see us being conformant? Or is it just good enough that the content that you have runs on top of the API? But we are looking at, into this. Uh, also, people ask me why, especially in the beginning when this was not fully implemented, you could just draw some squiggly triangles with it. People were asking, like, why are you bothering? Why are you doing this? Um, I've been doing a couple of uh, products or demonstration products with WebGL back in the day, and I, I find it really nice and productive environment for doing 3D. You can really easily play around with in there and feel relatively safe. Uh, also, Quitty Quick is, is a really nice and productive environment for doing 2D or 2.5D UIs. So, to, in my mind, combining these two is like a no-brainer. You get a really nice productive environment where you can have uh, 3D and 2D. Also, there is a lot of an innovation going around in WebGL, as I showed you. There is a lot of people working on stuff on top of WebGL. Now, having this API avail available in Qt QML uh, allows you to then take advantage of that, all that innovation that is going on, bought stuff over from the web into this environment, and that makes a lot of sense in my mind. And also there is a lot of resources on the web to get started with WebGL, so that helps, you can't really underestimate that. But then if we talk about, people also ask me like, so what about the Qt 3D 2.0? And I see Paul just joined us, welcome. Paul is one of the guys over there implementing the Qt 3D 2.0. And people ask me, well, aren't these a bit competitive APIs? Like, why are you doing these both? I don't see them as competitive. I see them as complementary. Uh, the other one is uh, Qt 3D is implementing a scene graph, a fully data-driven scene graph in C++. So it's going to be native. It's going to enable you to use all the latest uh, uh, features of OpenGL 3, OpenGL 4. That can't be done with WebGL. 
But then what WebGL gives you is this nice portability between web content, and, and it gives you the opportunity to do uh, content just by rendering from the uh, JavaScript. So it's, it is a, there are two different beasts, and whether you use the one or the other depends on your needs. It depends on the project that you are working on. And I would say that if you are considering doing 3D in Qt today, uh, I would say try them both. See which one works best for you. So what are the requirements? So at the moment, if you go and get Qt Canvas 3D, it requires you to have a Qt 5.3 or later. Uh, and of course, you need to have OpenGL API available in your system. Usually, it's an op uh, with a graphics card and a driver for that. So you need to have OpenGL ES uh, ES2 or OpenGL2. So how do you get it? It's available in the code review in the Qt uh, projects pages. And when you build it, just remember to add the make install step in the creator so that it gets installed when you build it. And then just open an example that we have included in the, in the uh, uh, Qt Canvas 3D and open it, build it, run, start hacking. It's, it should be really that simple. When I was making this component, I was really trying to keep all the dependencies to the rest of the Qt as minimal as possible just to make it sure that you can have this experience of downloading it and building it and running it. So what is different from WebGL? A mm, couple of things. Uh, naming. WebGL in the spec talks about HTML image elements, HTML canvas elements. Uh, of course, Qt Canvas doesn't have those. We have a custom texture 3D element. We have canvas 3D element instead of that. But basically, these are, in my mind, just uh, different names with mostly the same semantics. WebGL also names them the objects like WebGL render buffer, WebGL program. Uh, we name them with render buffer 3D, program 3D. And this is just to avoid because, as I said, we are not conformant, so we don't feel comfortable using a Kronos uh, trademark of WebGL in the, any of the APIs, not at this point. But none of the libraries that I've tried, or we have tried in the office, uh, have had any problems to, due to this, so nobody seems to be checking any of the names of the uh, objects of WebGL anywhere in the libraries, so that's good, shouldn't be a problem. Also, WebGL depends on heavily on typed arrays, which are basically a way of uh, having type data, massive amounts of type data in uh, JavaScript, and being able to pan that over efficiently over to the native side. We don't yet have that in the V4 VM or the JavaScript engine that we have in Qt, Qt Quick. So the preview uh, has custom typed array implementation, but I stress that this is the preview only. Once we get to the final release in 5.5, there is going to be typed arrays available in the Qt Quick JavaScript engine, and we will be switching over to using those. It will change the API from the preview a bit, but I don't see that as a really big problem. I see that as a positive thing to be able to move over to um, using the standard way of doing arrays. Here's a bit of a implementation detail, not going too much into this. Just showing you that what happens there is a kind of eternal loop of rendering. And the biggest thing that you should be worried about as a developer are those two signals coming out. InitGL, where we expect you to get the context from the canvas, uh, initialize any uh, 3D resources that you need, and then the render GL that is called each frame you need to render. And you do your own OpenGL rendering in there. I'll show this later on in the code examples, how that looks like. After that has been done, there is a bit of magic happening behind the scenes. Uh, the blue boxes, as you can see, these are um, running on the main thread. And the green boxes are running on the render thread. So there is a bit of a magic happening there, handing over then this data over to the render thread. But you don't have to worry about that. It's been all handled in, in behind the scenes. But I'm just showing you, you this because uh, a couple of people have been asking me, how do you do this? How could I do it myself for some other, other purposes? There are good examples in the scene graph folder in Qt uh, delivery. So go there, explore the examples that this is based on one of those. So then, how to use Qt Canvas 3D once you have it installed running in your system? So first of all, you need to, of course, import and declare Qt Canvas 3D. Uh, 
also we suggest all of our examples uh, include a JavaScript file just to keep the all the big amount of rendering code separate from the QML. You can inline it there, but it becomes really unwieldy really quickly, so I, I don't recommend that. Um, then you declare your Canvas 3D in there. At the moment, you still have to uh, specify what is the texture image loader instance that you are using. Um, this is still to be clarified. Do we have to have this in the final release? Um, it's a bit of a leftover from old days when we were doing stuff a bit differently in behind the scenes. It remains to be seen. Uh, then you have to implement the on init GL uh, signal handler. And in GL, what we do here is just call into the JavaScript file and keep it there. Also, same thing for the on render GL, which does the rendering of the frame. We just call the JavaScript file here. There are a couple of flags that you can use for logging, and those are the defaults. Uh, log all calls does exactly what it says on the tin. If you turn it on, you will start getting a huge dump of every uh, WebGL call that happens. It's useful. Uh, it's really useful for finding out where, where things go wrong, and especially if you are porting over a third-party library, it is a really useful tool. Log all errors, at the moment, it's defaults to true. So if some of you, if you have used uh, OpenGL-like APIs, the only way to know whether an API call has succeeded or failed in OpenGL is to call GL get error after calling it, and you have to call it, call it every time after each call, and it becomes really tedious really quickly. So this is just the convenience of logging any errors that happen uh, automatically. But at the moment, it defaults to true. Let's see whether we switch that to false also in, in the final release, because maybe you don't want to show all the errors that happen if you are doing a project for a customer, maybe, or something like that. Then you need to declare your texture loader 3D. Uh, people have asked, why, why do you have to have a separate texture loader? Well, this was basically just to keep the module as separate from the rest of the queue as possible. So I have a custom image loader that loads texture elements that you can then use to upload the texture data over to the OpenGL side. Uh, there are some plans I'll show you in the future section about how this could change in the future, but at the moment, this is what you do. Uh, we usually like to uh, wrap the loading of the texture, like we show here, so that we add the uh, Qt resource file prefix there. And it just helps because many of the web content that you have is assuming that you have a web page and there is a it, it's located in a certain URL, and every resource beneath that is located beneath that structure. So having this sort of uh, wrapper that does the prefixing that doesn't exist in the QML world uh, helps a bit in porting over the content. Then you need to handle the image loaded and in image loaded failed events, uh, signals that come out of it, and that's about it. So in the JavaScript code, during the initializing, we expect you to get the context, create the GL resources, start, start any textures loading, there is an example how to do that. The syntax is very similar. Uh, well, it is exactly the similar way how you do it in WebGL, how to get the context. Uh, we expect you to then handle texture loaded events. And there is an expect, uh, example how to do that. You just take the texture image, you sta check the state, whether it's loading finished. If it is finished, then great. You can start calling create texture, uh, uploading the data, setting up all the texture state, wrapping, all that, all that GL stuff after that. In the JavaScript code, you can also then, you have to do the rendering. And here's one point that you have to take care of. Uh, at the moment, the specification of WebGL states that the implementation must not handle high definition displays explicitly, uh, behind the scenes. So it has to be exposed explicitly to the uh, client. So that's what we have done. So you can get the device pixel ratio from Canvas, and it updates when you move the screen between, for example, a high definition screen and a low definition screen. Um, and then you just have to take that in, into account when you're calculating your width, rendering width and height, and calculating your perspective matrix and all that. Then you just usually do GL clear, clear your uh, color buffers, depth buffers, and then start drawing OpenGL. So let's look at some code examples. I'm going to be showing the cube, textured cube, which is from one of the examples that we include. Very similar to many of the WebGL tutorial uh, examples that you can find on the web. 
Uh, it just shows, um, I'm going to be showing mostly about how we have already in this example uh, used the Qt quick animations to help out with the uh, animation stuff that you have to have to do most, most often do in the in the 3D world. And then I'm going to be showing a more complex example, which is the car visualizer that I showed earlier running on the web page. I'm not going to go too deep into that, just showing again a bit about how we have using the uh, QT quick animations in there. So let's first look at the textured cube. Wow, really exciting. A textured cube floating in darkness of the space. But it's, it's a simple example to get you started. All this is now should be familiar. You saw this already in the slides. We import the Qt Canvas 3D. We build up our uh, Qt Quick Scene. We add the canvas in there. We make it fill the whole scene, uh, parent scene. Um, this is the way how we do uh, the animation. So we are adding properties to the Q, uh, canvas so that when we hand over the canvas in, in the um, render function, you just again then in the JavaScript just read these properties, which are then animated with sequential animations, all of these yeah, using the QML animations, and just use those as the rotations for the cube and movement of the cube in the actual rendering. Now, if we look at the uh, rendering code. Uh, this line here, um, you probably you want to have some sort of library for calculating all the matrix calculations that you have to do when you're doing 3D. I don't have a big preference over any of these. There are a couple of them available for JavaScript world. Uh, just happened to use this one first and it seems to work, so we are sticking with that for now. In the initGL, you can see that we are storing the canvas for later use. We are getting the context. We are setting def by use it, uh, buffering to true, so we are creating a def buffer. And we are setting anti-aliasing to true, so we are creating an anti-aliasing buffers, or super sampling buffers. Um, then we set the OpenGL state. And as you can see, we, this really works like it should. So you just set the state in the initialization phase. It doesn't change over the course of the rendering. You don't have to worry about that. We set the viewport, initialize shaders, initialize all the vertex data, color buffers. We start loading the texture. Here's the how you handle the texture loaded. Uh, we check that it's loaded, and we check that we don't have it yet loaded the cube texture. Uh, then we create a texture. We bind the texture uh, as active one. Uh, we upload the data with the text image 2D call using that texture image that was just loaded. Then we set a couple of parameters related to how the filtering works uh, in, in the texture, and we generate MIP maps for it. And that's all done there. In the render GL, what happens is the handling of the high definition displays, as I showed you, uh, handling of the perspective, transform setup, clearing the screen. Uh, then we build our model view matrix that uses now these properties that are animated with the uh, QML animation elements, and then you just do a bunch of rotations, translations on the, on the cube, and you set your matrix into the shader code. You say it's telling it, this is now the model view transform that you should be using, and then you call draw elements, which just then draws a bunch of triangles, which, may, which make up the faces of the cube, and that's done. And you can see that there is a lot more code happening here in, during the initialization, and the shader code is there. So as you can see, there is a lot of stuff that you have to do even to get this kind of simple cube running with WebGL. But don't worry. Uh, we have the uh, libraries available that make it easier so that you don't have to deal with this low-level stuff so much. So let's look at the uh, car visualizer uh, example. So this is now the same content. We started by porting the exactly the same content that was on the web page. It took me like uh, one and a half days to get that done. Um, I already had the tree JS ported, so that helped a lot. Uh, the biggest problem was that the content was a little bit encrypted. They, they had a page note in the page saying, if you really like to, go ahead and try to decrypt it and, and use it but we don't recommend, we have encrypted it, just so it's a bit difficult. Uh, it was a bit difficult, but in the end, I, I managed to do that, and, and I got it running. 
And uh, that took me like one and a half days to get like the basic stuff running. And I already had the uh, same exact same camera controls running that they had, use, had been using. Now then we started customizing this a bit. First of all, we ran into problems with using this on the mobile space. Uh, because the example was loading all the car models in the startup. First of all, it takes a long time on the mobile. Uh, then it crashes because sometimes, especially on, on for example, in my, on my Nexus 5, it depended on which programs I had I run previously, just before launching that, uh, whether it succeeded or not to launch the, launch the application. So what we did was uh, we did um, implement dynamic unloading and loading of the models. So we lo unload the previous model, we load a new model. Then we added animations for changing the color. So now the color changes smoothly instead of snapping into the one color. Then we added uh, custom camera uh, fixed camera positions that you can animate between. So you can have these like different views that you can use and everything transitions smoothly between those. And for example, then we did this trick that when you start adjusting the rims, it actually shows you the rims just to make sure that you are seeing what you are selecting. And if you choose to uh, change the uh, color of the car, we change the view so that you see body of the car. Now, if you go and look into the uh, QML file for this, uh, this is a bit involved. I just want to show you that we are using a bunch of these um, animation elements to do the uh, animations. It looks a bit convoluted, but this is just an optimization we wanted to do. We wanted to not be updating the color values when we are not animating them. So we did this really explicitly so that we, we can track like now, now the animation between two different colors has stopped and we can now uh, stop updating the values and just keep on using the ones that we have now uploaded to the GPU. It's a small optimization, but we wanted to do it like that just to be on the safe side. Here's the texture image loader, just like in previous examples. Canvas 3D. Um, the camera controls we customized. So we have now an item. An item is an invisible element of con uh, QML. And what we have there is state that switches between manual control or one of these fixed views. Uh, we have all the control data that is needed for the camera, like uh, look at position and where it should be in the scene. All of these are handled in here in the camera control. As you can see, here is one of the states uh, setting the, the, the camera control values to uh, what they need to be in each state. And then you just need to then say, well, when we transition from any state to any state, we want to use animation in our cubic uh, easing so it starts smoothly and ends smoothly and the duration for that. And then we just implemented the standard mouse area and do the control in there. Let's not go into this, that's a bit involved. And then we have just a bunch of uh, Qt Quick controls in here, just like you would have in any, any other QM, Qt Quick scene. And that's really about it. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail in, on the, in the into the JavaScript file itself. It is really involved. Uh, even though it's using a scene graph, it has hundreds of lines of code still. But as you can see, you can get pretty impressive results with that. So let's go back to the presentation. So now let me talk a little bit about, I've been talking about uh, 3JS, mentioning it quite a few times. So let's take a look into that. What is that? So it's a, one of the most active WebGL-based scene graphs out there. Uh, I think it gets some, like 15 to 20 commits per day. Uh, it's implemented in 100% with uh, JavaScript on top of WebGL. Uh, there is a lot of WebGL content out there that uses 3JS. It just, uh, we have a stable port available for Qt Canvas 3D. Um, I made it from the 67 dev version. There is a lot uh, has happened past that in the uh, 3JS development, but I've stuck with this one because they started to change the API and that breaks compatibility with some of the content on the web. So I'm sticking with this until we have content that is actually using the later versions. 
And there is the address where you can get this. Uh, it's available on the GitHub, mainly because 3JS was in the GitHub, so it was easy to branch it there and make the, so a couple of changes that you have to do to make it run on the, uh, on the Qt quick environment. Now, there is a couple of tips. If you want to go and port your own JavaScript content over to uh, Qt quick, uh, first of all, keep the delta small. It's obvious thing. These, many of these open source uh, developments, they uh, evolve really rapidly. As I said, 15 to 20 commits per day. Uh, if you take a week to port it, you are already 150 commits behind the trunk, so that's not nice. Um, all the uh, 3D, Qt 3D objects are uh, Qt objects that are exposed to Qt Quick JavaScript Engine. So be aware you, that, that you can't dynamically add attributes to uh, those from JavaScript. This was a bit of a problem with the uh, TreeJS, but you can luckily add things with array access methods. So instead of saying uh, buffer object dot belongs to equals something, you just say buffer object and put the uh, brackets in there and make, an, make up an index, and that's just what works fine. That's a workaround uh, to, to get the content running really quickly. And that's an easy, easy replacement to do. You just do a search and replace in the code, and it does it for you. Then one big gotcha was the Qt include. Uh, it imports all declared functions from the URL that you give it into the current namespace. Now you have to be aware that the first line in there, that is a valid declaration. The second line, that is not a valid function declaration, and it will not be imported by Qt include. Now, unfortunately, uh, quite a few libraries out there in the world use the latter approach to defining functions, defining classes. So it's a bit of a problem. We are aware of it. We are looking at how to solve this. Uh, there are a couple of op uh, options being considered, how to make this easier. But for now, you have to manually go in and, and change it. It's, it's not, again, a big change, and it's a, but it's a bit annoying to have that delta between you and the trunk. And then, as I said, if you're running on the mobile, please take care of the memory usage. It's, it's really easy to go overboard, especially when you're dealing with JavaScript. Even though it is JavaScript, it has a VM, it has a garbage collector, the memory is not infinite. Just be aware of that. Then a bit about the future. Currently, what we are planning is to get the um, release uh, a, a uh, fix all the severe bugs. We, we need to do code cleanup. It currently works on top of 5.3 and 5.4, so uh, you can go and get it now. Uh, we will be doing a technology technology preview release on top of 5.4. And that will still include these typed arrays that are a bit of a hack implementation. But uh, Qt Canvas 1. Point, uh, Qt Canvas 3D will be part of Qt 5.5 when it comes out officially. Will it, it will only compile and run on 5.5. Uh, and that is because in 5.5 we will have the typed arrays and we will be moving over to using those. Mainly because we are going to be, it's going to be much more efficient uh, memory wise. We are at the moment, I think we are using three times the amount of the memory that you should be using because of the implementation hacks that I've done. Um, and also it's more efficient, it's much more performant. There are some uh, proposed things and ideas. We have not committed to implement any of these yet, but these are floating in the air, maybe 1.1, 2.0 level stuff. Um, some of the, one of the biggest things is that maybe we should be moving all the OpenGL for calls from the main thread. As you can see, at the moment, you get all these signals to the rendering on the main thread, and then we execute those commands immediately. One way to do a work around this would be to implement a command queuing system, where we would just be storing all these commands in a queue on the main thread, and then handing that queue of commands over to the render thread and executing them there. It is a bit involved because you have these nasty calls in GL called re, uh, GL read pixels and GL get error that cause then you to have a sync point. You have to execute all the commands up to that point and then execute that command. So it's not a trivial implementation to do. And that was one of the reasons why I chose this approach in this first version. Um, but what that would give us, it would then allow us to support the various uh, uh, SyncGraph texture provider 
classes as texture sources, one of them would be image. So you would be able to use uh, the normal image element in the uh, QML as a texture source. And you could also use shader effect source as a source of texture, which would make it uh, possible for you to make up a 2D QML scene and use that as a texture into WebGL. Uh, that would be really cool. Also, you could then implement uh, a non-FBO approach. What happens currently is that when we execute all these commands, we render them into an FBO on the main thread, and then we hand over that FBO over to the render thread. So in the render thread, we then blit this FBO on the screen. So that's an addi additional copy. It does cost some performance, but it does give you a lot of flexibility, because now we can have this uh, canvas element in the scene at any zipped dev order you like. But uh, it's cost per performance, and I think that the biggest thing is that uh, we lose anti-aliasing on mobile devices because many of those don't support anti-aliasing uh, anti rendering onto an FBO. So if we would uh, move the rendering to render thread, we would be able to do this technique of rendering beneath the QML content or rendering on top of it. Either way, we could render directly into the same buffer and avoid this copy. Uh, some of the other two things that we are looking at is profiling tools. I mean, we have the Qt quick uh, profiling tools available. Would maybe make sense to add stuff for related to WebGL in there or Qt Canvas 3D in there. Also, there is a big pile of different extensions available for WebGL. We are looking at those. We, I know that 3JS, for example, tries to use the float texture extension, but that's not implemented yet. Uh, maybe it would be worth worthwhile to explore which extensions we should be adding into the API later on. But that's mainly about it. So as a recap, we went through what is WebGL. I showed you a couple of examples, what can be done with WebGL. Uh, I showed how I introduced you to the Can Qt Canvas 3D, how to, showed how to use it in your own code. Um, talked a bit about feature plans, and now it's time for questions. Thank you. So your questions? Uh, when I played with the uh, open G uh, WebGL, uh, I usually saw that uh, the browser uh, suggests, the page suggests to show the engine for WebGL. It was or Adobe Flash or HTML5 Canvas. Uh, am I right that uh, here, uh, de facto, we have an additional uh, engine, which is a Qt Quick engine uh, for 3D rendering, for OpenGL rendering? Uh, for 3JS. Yep. Yes, there is an additional engine. Let me show it. Uh, the code there. So what I have done here is um, I've done just, as I told you, just to keep the delta small, I've implemented some wrappers, but I do have a separate Canvas 3D render implemented. This is based on the WebG WebGL renderer really heavily. The delta is really in the aspects of, of uh, things where, where you can't really, um, where, where you have to work around the limitations of the V4VM or the virtual machine that we run into. So, so we can, for example, you can see that there is this uh, uh, buffer belongs to attribute index hack that I can use to get around the stuff that they, they want to add attributes to programs dynamically, and that doesn't work in the in these. But the, the, uh, my goal here is that once we get the typed arrays, is to get the delta so small that it will be just a couple of lines of change here, and, and re get rid of the rest of the delta in the in the library by somehow allowing us to include the JavaScript libraries a bit more efficiently. But actually in the render code, if you look at the render code and compare this and the WebGL renderer, uh, there is not, no difference. There's a question over there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what is the attitude 
of integrating WebGL into Qt and not going in straightforward uh, integration between HTML5 and uh, and WebGL for new application. I don't I don't carry in this question uh, in this question that we want to extend somehow the, somehow the existing uh, application, but this is for a completely new application. Uh, do you mean that why would you use WebGL for a new application in your QML application? WebGL, yes. Uh, there's also a question WebGL versus native GL, but also a question uh, why integrate WebGL with Qt and not uh, deliver uh, HTML uh, user interface? Ah, good question. Um, it's maybe down to whether you want to just take advantage of the, uh, well, as I said, it's all about trying to combine the best bits of Qt Quick and WebGL. Uh, I have done some project using WebGL and HTML, and I have to say that I, at least I find implementing HTML5 UIs a bit painful. It's not as easy and con convenient as it is with QML. So that's the, that's the driving factor behind in integrating this API in there. Uh, but if you want to, there is the WebGL is also available with the Qt Web Engine. So you can just include the whole Qt web engine into your uh, QML scene and do HTML5 UIs on top of that if you like to. But that then brings the whole web engine into your application and it, it is a bit more heavy. So one of the things that I tried to do here was to keep this really lightweight, a really small library that when you include it, it doesn't add to your memory footprint, uh, the application's memory footprint print that much. More questions? Thank you. And uh, um, my first question is uh, uh, implementation related. Uh, am I correct that uh, Qt Canvas 3D is basically implemented over OpenGL desktop for desktop platform and uh, on OpenGL ES2 for embedded ones? Exactly. Yes. Okay, so it chooses the, the right backend that... Uh, yeah. Did. Actually, what we have done is we have implemented in on top of the Q OpenGL classes oh. that does this automatically for us. Okay, okay, makes sense. And uh, then I would like to, in, to insist a bit more on uh, porting existing WebGL content to Qt Canvas 3D because uh, I totally see the point uh, of this module and this would allow us to, uh, you know, reuse uh, uh, WebGL code we had we have uh, coded for customer uh, almost as it is. Yeah. So before you, you have shown something like a JS uh, um, adaptation layer you know, to um, bridge the existing WebGL content with Qt Canvas 3D. So basically my question is whether you think it's possible to have something like a standard wrapper or would you need to each time tailor and code a new adaptation layer for Qt Canvas 3D? Good question. Um, probably. There, there is some stuff that could be shared. For example, all these uh, HTML element wrappers, so because the libraries use HTML elements usually. Uh, for example, image element. Um, maybe using, reusing those wrappers would make sense. Um, good point. Haven't really gotten so far into thinking this. Yeah, because uh, you see, I, I would sure use a, a CI use case uh, for uh, for some at least two or three customer projects of ours, where we would have benefited a lot from uh, uh, using cute quick primitives like animation, like you shown yeah. in the in the cars demo. Uh, at, at least for me, the main use case for cute canvas 3D is uh, you know being able to take. Uh, existing content libraries uh, uh, written for WebGL and, and being able to port them in a friendly Qt Quit contest uh, yeah. in the, the last, I mean, 
as small uh, effortless as possible. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, maybe it's something for you to consider for the development. I mean, try and get uh, an adaptation layer uh, that, that uh, developers can use to reuse existing content without too much effort. Yeah, that's good point. Good point. Could consider maybe um, whether we include it as part of this library, or maybe we could just include it as part of the examples, so to just copy paste it from there or anything like that. But good yeah. point. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, even including it as uh, as an example, you know, as a uh, half baked uh, half baked uh, layer would be more than fine because I mean I'm totally fine that you need to bridge the two worlds something because it's, yeah. it's two very different worlds uh, WebGL and Qt Quick totally fine with it uh, even a skeleton to start from would be very very useful yeah but, uh, oh, thanks thank you. that's a good comment thank you more questions okay so then thank you for the great presentation thank you